All right, next up we've got Carl Krause. Hey, Carl. Hi. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, yeah, thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm a 3D generalist from Germany. Um, my main focus is on LuchDev and everything related to effects and procedural stuff. Um, uh, and I'm working at uh, Seesucht Berlin at the moment, where I do mostly commercials. Right on. So what's the work that you're going to be presenting on today? Yes. Um, so um, my presentation is about the animation I did for uh, day 10 of the Mardini challenge. The topic was river. And um, when I was looking for an idea on how to approach the topic, for some reason I thought about how, as a kid, I always played around with my food on my plate. And then that, that gravy can look like a river from a certain angle. So I started to build a gravy river flowing through a mountain of mashed potatoes. And uh, in my presentation, I will show you a bit how I built the scene. And I will focus on a few things that might be interesting when it comes to scattering and modeling stuff fast in Houdini. Every kid can relate to this one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's jump in. Hi, and welcome to my presentation for day 10 of the Mardini Challenge, the Gravy River. For these Mardini challenges, I always had to put a focus on one aspect of the scene, something I wanted to achieve or to try out. Because I work full-time during the week, I only had a couple of hours in the evening for creating and rendering the scene. For this project, I wanted to create something that looks tasty. Shading was important, but I was mostly interested in building some tools which would allow me to shape and arrange my assets in a user-friendly way. I will show you now how I set up the scene. In particular, I will go over the easier models first and then cover the more complex assets in more detail. I will also explain how I created the shaders and I will give some rendering tips in the end for setting up a scene with Redshift. When I started building the scene, I started with the plate because I needed it to place my camera and figure out my framing. After that, I added a napkin and a fork to have a bit more detail in the scene. I will show you quickly how I modeled them. I started by putting down a curved sub and created points on the grid till I got the basic shape of a plate. I usually turn on grid snapping when creating points. It's easier for me that way to get straight lines. Then I resampled the curve and revolved the spline around the origin. At the last step, I scaled it till it was roughly the size of a real plate. It's a good habit to make sure the objects have a real world size to not run into any issues later during simulation. To make the scene more interesting and add a bit of contrast, I created a second plate with a darker color. For that, I copied my node tree and changed the curve to get a flatter profile. Now for the fork. I started with the curve sop again and created a rough outline. Then I used an edit sop to move the points while having the viewing flag on a resample node to see the smooth results. After that, I remeshed it and attached a poly extrude to give it some depth. Then I used a couple of bend subs with small capture regions to give the fork its iconic shape. I converted the geo to a VDB with a VDB from Polygon and blurred it with a VDB smooth SDF. This way, I got smooth edges on the whole object. Then I converted it back to polygons and the asset was ready. For the napkin, I started with a grid, gave it some UVs with a UV project sub and then used the bend sub again to fold it two times. I added a vellum cloth node with default settings and a vellum solver. To freeze the sim, I added a time shift node. By default, there is an expression in the frame field, but you can break it by control shift clicking on it and write your frame number in it. I then gave the napkin some depth with a poly extrude sub and placed it besides the plate. Okay, now for the more complex assets. When I started with the mashed potatoes, I thought about how I could build a setup that would allow me to have a lot of artistic control but it's also fast and easy to manipulate. When it comes to procedural assets with a lot of detail, I usually like to bring my mesh to like 80 or 90% and then do the rest, the detailing and the shading. This way I have a good sense for the shape, but I don't have to deal with super high geometry in the viewport. This extra detail only gets created at render time. For the setup, I decided to start with a lot of sphere sobs. Spheres are fast to place and easy to resize. I converted them to a VDB 
and back to polys to get a clean surface. Then I used an attribute noise sop with a low amplitude to get a more broken up silhouette. I had to get rid of the geo that intersected the plate. I imported the plate geo with an object merge and plugged it into the second slot of a group sop set to bounding object. The thing with a group is that it always has a hard edge. To get a soft edge, I had to convert it to an attribute. Then I blurred it with an attribute blur. On a side stream, I used a ray sub to project the geo down to the plate. This looks like an error, but I will use the custom attribute as a mask to blend between the original geo and this one. For this, I use an attribute wrangle with a lerp function. The lerp function needs three inputs the first original point position, then the projected point position coming from the second input, and our mask. So far, so good. There are a few areas where our geometry is still overlapping, but we don't have to worry about this. Because I converted the geo to a VDB and then used the VDB reshape set to open. The open function internally first shrinks the volume down, so thin voxel areas are erased, and then it expands the volume again by the same amount. By doing that, the shape stays roughly the same size, but the thin areas around the edges are gone. Nice. And the cool thing is, this setup is still fast enough to change or append input spheres. This way, I could easily sculpt my mashed potato mountainscape. Now I needed to dig the path for the gravy into it. I wanted it to look like it was carved by a fork. For that, I used the curve sop again. With point snapping mode activated, I created a path on the surface. Then I resampled the curve, and on a second stream, I created the shape of a simplified fork. I combined the two streams in a sweep node to get the profile of a fork carving through the meshed potatoes. I converted the mesh into a VDB again and smoothed it. Now I combined the meshed potatoes and the fork path with a VDB combined set to STF difference. Then I converted it back to polygons. To finish the modeling part, I applied another attribute noise sub to give it some additional small scale noise. And now for the shading. I created a RS material with a bright desaturated yellow color for the diffuse and rough reflection. For the displacement, I started with a simple Maxon noise. By the way, if you press the button with a little bug on it, you only see this node without any shading in the IPR. Just the raw color. This is super helpful. I created five RS Maxon noises with different scalings and types. The default noise type is always a good start for me, but I also used some fancier ones like Cranial and FBM for additional detail. Then I combined them with the RS color layer. I put the first noise in the base layer and multiplied or added the rest onto it, which results in a nice uneven pattern. To use displacement on your geometry, you have to go to the object level and enable tessellation and displacement in the Redshift object tag. Then I fitted the noise in the RS displacement node with a very low intensity, but it should still look almost too strong when rendered with a diffuse color only. Because when we enable subsurface scattering, we will lose a lot of the detail again. I set a small radius for the SSS and gave it a similar but more saturated color than I did for the diffuse. You can additionally use some of the noises for breakups in the roughness, but I didn't have time for that. I had to continue with the piece. I created a quick scatter setup for them, which I want to go over, because I find it very handy and artist-friendly. By the way, by pressing Ctrl 2, you can split the viewport. This comes in handy when you want to draw something from an orthographic view, but want to keep seeing your camera view too. I started with creating a draw sub and drew some areas in the top view where I wanted my piece to appear. The curves don't have to close, because I closed them right away with an end sub set to close straight. Now we have closed areas. Now I put down a scatter sub and scattered some points. I increase the relaxed iterations to get them evenly spaced out. This helps later to not get any intersecting piece. I also put in the expression $f for the global seed. This means that we get a new point distribution every frame. I'll show you in a second why this is helpful. For the actual piece, I put down a sphere with a small scale and a low frequency. Then I put down a vellum cloth with default settings. With this low resolution, the sphere can keep its shape only through the bend stiffness. We don't need any pressure or strut constraints. Now about the soft body sim. In order to get a sphere at every scattered point, I right-clicked on the solver and choose Allow Editing of Content. 
when diving inside, this will look a bit confusing if you see this for the first time. But we only have to find the dot net and dive inside. Inside the dot net, we have to change in the vellum source node the emission type to instance on points and put in the link to our scattered points. If we would leave it like that, vellum would generate a new set of p's each frame. That's why I typed $f equals equals 1 or $f equals equals 3 in the activation field. Now we only get two sets of p's on frame 1 and on frame 3. If we now hit simulate, we get p's falling down. I imported the plate and the mashed potatoes with an object merge and piped it in the third input of the solver. Now the spheres can collide with the scene. The $f expression in the scatter sub helps now with getting a different distribution for the second pair of p's. By the way, the tool works fast enough so that I can paint new areas and add more points interactively. To get some variation in the shading, I created a connectivity sub and then used the newly created class attribute as a seed value in an attribute randomize. This gets random colors per object. The shader is very easy. I used the imported random colors with a RS point attribute node. The attribute is called CD. I then remapped these values with a RS ramp node to get different shades of green and piped that in the diffuse color of the shader. To get more variation in the shape, I used the max and noise as a bump map. In the bump map strength, I used a very small value. It should only be a subtle effect. I adjusted the reflection roughness and that's it. Super simple shader, but effective. And now the gravy. It's basically a flip sim with a bit of viscosity. Let's go quickly over it. I started with the sphere as the fluid source. I wanted the gravy to behave natural, like it's getting poured irregularly. That's why I used motion effects to get some random scaling behavior. You can add this by right clicking on any parameter and choose motion effects. I used the noise preset. It reminds me a bit of the wiggle expression in After Effects. I used the emit particle fluid shelf tool as a starting point. But you can also build it yourself. You need a flip source and a dot net. I object merged everything into the scene that I wanted the fluid to collide with. In this case, the plate, the potatoes and the peas. I used the static collision shelf tool and increased the voxel size till the resolution of the collision VDB was high enough. Now we dive into the dot net. On the flip solver, I activated reseeding, changed the kernel under the volume motion to swirly and enabled viscosity. In the flip object, I put in a value of 0.3 for the viscosity, which after some testing gave me nice results. In the volume source, I only had to make sure that the preset is set to source flip and the input is the first context geometry. As a suggestion, if flip is new for you, use the shelf tools and try to rebuild them. That helped me understanding them better. Now for the meshing. In the particle fluid surface sub, I changed the output to surface VDB to be able to reshape it later. In the filtering tab, I played around with the blurring and closing of the shape. I went for a more aggressive filtering to get a smoother surface. Then I converted it back to polys. In the shader, I put the weight of the refraction to 0.8, so I got a bit of brownish diffuse color left. But the main part of the shader is a subsurface contribution under the refraction tab. I used the extinction setting with very high values for the extinction scale and the scatter scale. And that's it. And the scene is almost ready for rendering. I set the camera position right in the beginning of the project. It's a 60mm lens and I enable depth of field. I didn't have much time to create a fancy light setup. It's just one big ass area light which made really soft shadows. But it works, I guess. I also used the photographic exposure of the redshift post effects. I never tried them before Madini because I usually do my color correction and that stuff in comp, but it's a nice way to get a beautiful image right in the render view. Here are my render settings. I kept my samples low to finish the rendering on time, but I activated the Altus denoiser, which cleans up the image very nicely. And here is my submitted animation again. I noticed after rendering that I stupidly forgot to take the displacement of the mashed potatoes into consideration when the gravy flows over it. That's why you see a few ugly edges of mashed potatoes sticking out of the gravy. But here's a quick fix to deal with this. In the mashed potato object, I import the gravy fluid and attribute transferred a custom attribute onto the mesh with a soft falloff. Now, where the gravy is closed, the attribute is 1, everywhere else it is 0. I use this attribute now in the shader of the mashed potato 
to dial down the displacement. In a color mix node, I plug the existing noise layer in the first input. As a second input, I select a black color. Now I use the important attribute as a mask to blend between the two. And this is how the fixed gravy animation looks like. I hope you enjoyed this making of, and if you have any questions left, feel free to write me an email or visit my website. Thanks for listening.